Kevin Allen Dooley Inc. is a technical research and invention firm based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It was founded in January of 2013 by partners Kevin Dooley and Elwood Morris. The two share a 40-year working relationship at former employer Pratt & Whitney Canada, which is a gas turbine aircraft engine manufacturer. Mr. Dooley spent much of his time in the position of fellow emerging technologies, where he was involved in various technical problem-solving disciplines. During the course of his time there, he received the title of inventor on over 100 issued patents to date, particularly in the fields of electronics, electromagnetics, mechanics, and acoustics. Mr. Elwood Morris was a professional aerospace engineer who was involved in the development of the JT-15D aircraft engine and was a customer liaison to Cessna, Learjet, and Mitsubishi. Kevin Allen Dooley Incorporated was formed after the two partners took up a special interest in some of the unusual health claims being made about infrasound exposure. This initial interest has since led to the publication of two research papers authored by Dooley et al. by the Acoustic Society of America, as well as the development of infrasound production and active suppression technology. Early prototypes have already undergone successful field testing, and beta versions of this system have also been built and successfully tested for performance. The firm is presently working on an automotive pilot study to explore the potential reduction of passenger motion sickness and driver fatigue in automobiles. All forms of airborne sound are simply tiny, rapid fluctuations in the local barometric pressure which cause the eardrum to flex in and out, resulting in us perceiving sounds. Infrasound is precisely the same thing but at a slower fluctuating rate than we can hear. The barometric fluctuation rate is called the frequency of the sound. The sound is measured in cycles per second, which is also called hertz. We perceive frequency as the pitch of the sound. The actual barometric pressure fluctuation is called the sound pressure. We perceive the sound pressure level as the loudness of a sound. A piano keyboard is a convenient way of illustrating frequency. What's shown here is the lowest of an AT key piano. Along the bottom is the frequency of each of the keys. The lowest frequency which is 27.5 Hz and here the highest frequency we're showing is 58.2. So this is how you can imagine the pitch being related to frequency. The dBA chart shown here is what sound measuring instruments use to judge what a person would normally hear and be affected or possibly annoyed by. So based on this A weighting, the lowest note on a piano at about 28 Hz would be attenuated by about 40 decibels in terms of what is displayed on the sound level meter relative to the actual pressure fluctuation generated when that key of a piano is struck. The graph below the DBA chart is known as a narrow band spectrum plot or graph. This particular graph is actually a recording made in a home not far from a wind turbine, actually about a half a kilometer away. The frequency which is shown left to right is from 0 Hz on the left to about 80 Hz on the far right, representing the frequency of measured pressure fluctuations. On the lower right hand corner of the graph, the red triangle is representative of the red triangle on the DBA chart. This is the same area or frequency of coverage. The orange area depicts the infrasound region. The graph shown here is the same graph we were just viewing, but somewhat zoomed to focus more on the infrasound portion of the graph. The orange shaded area again represents the infrasound portion of the frequency range. The vertical spikes sticking out of the various shaded curved lines are the exact frequencies related to the wind turbines in the vicinity of the house and are referred to as blade passing harmonics. The curved lines themselves are known as the background noise level. Modern building faulty ventilation systems and industrial installations and more recently wind turbines have been implicated in various forms of complaints, nausea among these, which have been described by some as being the result of infrasound. More recently several well-known acousticians have noted that these symptoms share some features with motion sickness symptoms. A common argument opposing the proposition is that there is no scientific evidence to support the claim that infrasound causes illness. 
Paul Shoma, Robert Rand, as well as Rick James, have all made reference to motion sickness symptoms in relation to the effects of infrasound on some people. Our theory of wind turbine infrasound propagation relates to a physical phenomenon known as spinning modes. This hypothesis, developed during 2013, was published in January 2014 with measurements and equations by the Acoustic Society of America as a preliminary hypothesis. More recent research publications on non-wind turbine type rotors from scientists at NASA Lewis show measurement evidence of spinning modes in a wind tunnel. This evidence is presently believed to be the result of some form of measurement error, however, behaves as we predict spinning modes should behave. We're in discussion with the primary author of the paper, a Dr. Xaba Horvath, who is presently reviewing our publication relative to his findings. The theory results in a radiation pattern depicted in the cartoon diagram shown. The radiation appears to be propagated in a virtual tunnel shape behind the turbine and causes infrasonic barometric pressure fluctuations around its path. The direction of the propagation changes as the angle of the wind turbine is adjusted to point into the wind. Thus, the disturbance will affect different areas depending on the wind direction. Along with atmospheric conditions, the level of the pressure disturbance is dependent on the power output of the turbine and various design factors. As wind turbine power output increases, the infrasound magnitude also increases. The display we're seeing here in the middle of the screen is an oscilloscope display. An oscilloscope is a type of instrument we often see on a heart monitor. It displays how something is changing as a function of time. Both bright dots moving across the display in this case are showing the variation in barometric pressure as a function of time. The sensor connected to the lower dot is located in an upstairs bedroom of Norma and Ron Schmidt's house. The upper sensor is located in the kitchen where the instruments are located. The home is in Underwood, Ontario. The house is located about 500 meters from the closest wind turbine. What we're seeing here is the fluctuation in the barometric pressure in the home, which is occurring at a frequency identical to the blade passing frequency of the turbines in the immediate area of the home. This blade passing frequency is 0.72 Hertz, or 0.72 cycles per second, far below a frequency that humans perceive as sound, but well within the sensitivity of our eardrums or tympanic membrane, as it is known medically. This variation in barometric pressure is a very small fluctuation relative to the barometric pressure itself, but has a sound pressure level somewhat louder than loud speech at a distance of about two feet from a person speaking. This level is about 60 to 65 decibels on average, but reaches much higher and much lower levels over a period of time, as we can see from the oscilloscope display. The display is calibrated in pascals. Each centimeter is about 0.1 pascal. The pressure signals have been filtered such that only the fundamental blade passing frequency is shown. There are five or six significant harmonics also present in the home, but have been filtered to improve the visibility of the fundamental pressure fluctuation. As the barometric pressure rises, the position of the bright dot moves upwards on the screen. As the barometric pressure drops, the dot moves downwards. The up and down cycling of these dots shows that the pressure is cycling up and down. This slide shows precisely the same phenomenon in a different home in Port Elgin, Ontario. There is just one turbine in Port Elgin, which is much smaller than the turbines in Underwood, about 0.5 megawatts versus 1.7 megawatt turbines in Underwood. The turbine in Port Elgin rotates at about twice the RPM as the larger turbines, generating blade passing frequencies of approximately 1.4 Hz or 1.4 cycles per second. The display shows the higher frequency as more rapid fluctuations in the barometric pressure on both sensors. The actual magnitude of the pressure fluctuations in Barb Lowe's home is lower than in Norma's home. Barb's home is located over two kilometers from the small turbine in Port Elgin, but is also located up on a hill with an essentially unobstructed view of the turbine. A second factor we believe may be a significant contributor to the relatively high infrasound level in the home is the location of a water tower behind Barb's house. The water tower is positioned such that reflections of the pressure waves from the turbine off the water tower will arrive at Barb's house at about the same instant the pressure waves will arrive directly from the turbine. This causes the pressures to add together, resulting in an increase in the pressure fluctuations in the home. The pressure waves are expected to be highest at Barb's home with a southeasterly wind. 
We're going to get into a, a little discussion now on a previously unnoticed relationship between motion and infrasound, based on research work on motion sickness by Michael McCauley et al. in 1976. McCauley's work was commissioned by the US Navy to attempt to establish a mathematical prediction method of motion sickness presumably in Navy personnel in a transport situation. We will also discuss some research performed by David Nussbaum, which we recently found in the Toronto Reference Library, which shows a solid link between motion sickness symptoms, such as nausea, dizziness, headaches, etc., and infrasound in some people. The following observations sourced from various studies are being presented here to show similarities between independent issues as they relate to infrasound exposure. It should be noted that personnel at Kevin Allen Dooley Inc. are not medical researchers. The data itself, other than the Nussbaum data, are common symptoms found online. The Nussbaum data is from Dr. Nussbaum's 1985 PhD thesis. Chest cavity vibration and some tingling sensations were a common experience for many test subjects and was expected at the infrasound levels used. Dr. Nussbaum, who exposed 80 volunteer subjects to a 30-minute infrasound exposure of 130 decibels while monitoring several physiological parameters, also provided a physiological hypothesis describing potential reasons for the differences in sensitivity to infrasound between different people. All of the motion sickness symptoms listed are observed in Nussbaum's symptoms except for vomiting. The majority of so-called wind turbine syndrome symptoms were also noted in Nussbaum's report as being evident in his sensitive test subjects. This, of course, is besides disturbed sleep since all of his subjects were wide awake during the experiments. At least half of the symptoms normally associated with sleep deprivation are listed in Nussbaum's test subject responses. We believe that the symptoms displayed in test subjects of either of the other two comparison groups may cause sleep disturbances, sufficient to lead to sleep deprivation symptoms. When a ship moves up and down as a result of the waves in the water, its elevation relative to the average sea level varies. If we measure barometric pressure, we can show that barometric pressure varies with elevation. This is a common method of measuring altitude. The barometric pressure drops by 12 pascals for every meter of increase in elevation above average sea level. If we bob up and down by a total of plus minus half a meter, we are being exposed to infrasound of a magnitude of about 105 decibels at a frequency corresponding to the rate of bobbing, probably in the range of 0.2 to 0.5 hertz or so. Is it the motion of bobbing up and down or the related infrasound that makes some people nauseous? Based on David Nissbaum's results, I think the answer is clear. In 1976, Michael E. McCauley and a team of scientists embarked on a very significant study commissioned by the U.S. Navy Office of Naval Research to gain an understanding of vertical and pitch and roll related motion sickness incidents so that this ailment may be predicted ahead of time using a mathematical equation. The testing was based on the acceleration and the frequency and exposure time of thousands of paid test subjects who were students from four different universities. This testing was performed using the highest standards of experimental research using a very professional approach and scientific controls. Each student involved in the motion sickness incidence testing was only used for a single two-hour maximum test and was not used again in the motion sickness incidence testing. A key comment made by Macaulay on page 15 in his report was the following. A failure to find systematic increase in motion sickness incidence from pitch and roll supports previous investigators who suggested that the vertical component of sea motion is of primary etiological significance for motion sickness. This comment is significant since infrasound is generated in vertical motion to a degree which is much higher than pitch or roll motion. Also, vertical acceleration is not specifically sensed by our vestibular system, but pitch and roll is, as is rotation. The equipment used by Macaulay and his team was similar to an elevator compartment which was divided into two separate air-conditioned compartments with separate doors and seats. 
The seats were aircraft type seats with seat belts and a communication panel for the subjects to signal how they felt at specifically requested periods. TV cameras were used to monitor the test subject from the control room. The testing was such that it was run for up to two hours or until the subject actually vomited into an air sickness bag. This approach removed any subjective interpretation as to how sick the subject believed they felt. The compartment was attached to a motion generator control system which allowed motions of the compartment at a range of acceleration and frequency settings. The actual displacement or elevation of the compartment was not considered important and thus was not recorded as a parameter of interest. In our own research into potential links between infrasound and nausea, we used the test data acceleration and frequency points published in an appendix to Macaulay's report to back calculate the vertical displacements his test subjects were exposed to. This allowed the estimation of the infrasonic pressures they may have been exposed to during the testing. Because the actual seal characteristics of the test compartment are unknown, we can only say that the pressure variations were on the outside of the test compartment and do not know the absolute pressures on the inside of the compartment, but it is reasonable to assume the pressure inside was proportional to the pressure outside the compartment, since the compartment was not airtight. The striking correspondence between the conditions causing the highest infrasound level and the conditions causing the highest motion sickness incidence is indisputable. The graph on the left is from the Macaulay report and shows motion sickness incidence as a function of frequency and acceleration. The graph on the right shows the back calculated infrasound level outside the test compartment as a function of the same frequency and acceleration values Macaulay subjects were subjected to during the motion sickness testing. The simplicity of a pressure model for MSI or mo motion sickness incidence when compared to the model proposed by Macaulay et al. is quite striking. The equation at the top of this slide is the pressure model the equation at the lower half of the slide is the Macaulay model. This graph shows a comparison between the model predictive results versus the actual results obtained for the Macaulay model. Each point on the graph is representative of the average of 20 individual test subjects' responses. The line running through the points is the mean of those responses. The graph shown here is the comparison between the predicted responses based on the calculated pressures on the outside of the motion generator compartment as compared to the actual responses obtained. As with the previous graph, each point represents the average of 20 individual test subjects. What this demonstrates is that if you only know the pressure and you don't know the motion, you will calculate essentially the same motion sickness incidence as Macaulay calculates knowing the acceleration and the frequency. The simplicity of the model and the fact that the pressure model predicts motion sickness incidence with virtually the same accuracy as is predicted by Macaulay model tends to indicate that vertical motion sickness is quite possibly a result of the infrasound component rather than the acceleration effects, which are normally assumed to be the only biodynamic stimulus involved in the vertical type motion sickness. The pressure model suggests that no acceleration or movement is actually required to produce motion sickness incidence. Rather, all that may be required is infrasound exposure of sufficient level during a given exposure period. This lines up with Nussbaum's research findings. The implication of this hypothesis, if proven, are numerous and could include showing additional scientific evidence that infrasound can cause temporary illness in some young healthy people. Motion sickness may be avoided if the related pressure fluctuations can be reduced or eliminated. A study on the effects of low-level infrasound exposure are needed to ascertain longer-term exposure effects and their similarity or differences to shorter-term high-level infrasound exposure. The shorter-term high-level infrasound exposure effects are already reported in the literature as being the same as motion sickness symptoms by Nussbaum. The pressure model for MSI developed here may or may not be valid for low levels of infrasound. However, the model shows with levels of infrasound of about 60 decibels at 0.72 Hz, an MSI of about 0.3 after 2.5 months is predicted.